ready. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to part three of our conference. Um, the third and final part. We're going to rattle on fairly quickly because you all know the rules. You all know what to do and what not to do. Um, and uh, there will be no technical problems this time. So first of all, we've got Steve Garda, who will be very well known to virtually all of you. He's been around longer than I care to remember. Well, most of us have. Um, very well known recently for his work on the Hammond Gardner manuscripts and the notes in the books that have been coming out regularly on that. Also known for his shanties and his uh, maritime songs expertise. So uh, this is a third talk I think he's given us about his... Uh, yeah, his number three on the collecting, yeah. On his collecting work. So um, over to you, Steve, to start us off. Okie dokie, right. Uh, on the 15th of January 1927, Rafe Vaughan Williams visited the quiet village of Woodlands near Cranbourne in Dorset, ostensibly to note down the songs of a local couple, Shepherd Willie Miles and his wife. I've not yet been able to find out if Vaughan Williams just happened to be in Woodlands in the middle of winter, having come all the way from London, or whether he'd been informed of the Miles, Miles's songs by some local dignitary who was aware of his work. Vaughan Williams started to collect folk songs in 1902 and continued to sporadically collect them up to 1913. He added one song in 1922, and then in 1926, he received a letter from a Mrs. Johnston at Evershot in Dorset, offering some ballads, and he visited her and noted them down on the 31st of July, 1926. But Evershot is quite a distance on the other side of Dorset from Woodlands, and that visit was in the middle of summer. No letter has so far been found to Vaughan Williams from Woodlands in Dorset, Arguably, the most influential person in Woodlands for many years was its first vicar, the Reverend Charles Knapp. So remember that name, the Reverend Charles Knapp, he's important. Vaughan Williams' father was also a vicar, so there is a slight possibility that they knew each other, or perhaps someone else in the village was aware of Vaughan Williams' work and simply wrote to him about the Mileses because they were known as singers of the songs. Um, I've been very lucky. Uh, I, I, all I knew about the uh, Miles couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miles, was was very very little. And was from uh, a, a, an acquaintance of theirs who I met uh, a while back. Um, but very lucky this weekend in that the um, uh, ancestry site has suddenly decided to put all of the um, uh, census forms up. Uh, right up to 1911 uh, for free on the internet. So I delved into that and came up with, uh, William was born in 1864. His wife, who was called Jane, who I didn't know that, J Jane was born in 1868. In 1927, when Vaughan Will Will Williams recorded them, therefore William was 63 and Jane was 59. Uh, and in the 1901 and 1911 censuses, he is described as a carter on the farm, although my correspondent knew him as Shepherd Willie Miles, uh, and that was at a farm called Knoll Hill Farm. In 1911, they had six children, and by 1927, all six would be over 21, and probably most of them left home. Um, so, uh, although the details on the manuscripts of the songs that Vaughan Williams collected from them are somewhat unclear as to origins, it is possible by matching up tunes, texts and references to identify seven songs noted down from the miles that day. Uh, can we have the table up, uh, Martin, please? There we go. Right. You can see there uh, the songs that they were uh, collected by um, Vaughan Williams. And you can see that the uh, references for the first three, the, those are for the texts. And they are actually down uh, in the collection of uh, Maud Carpley's. Um, 
for some reason, that probably he took down the words and then passed the words. He wasn't particularly interested in the words and passed them on to Maud Carpley's, and they ended up in her manuscripts. But the rest were all tunes. He took down the tunes of, of all of those others, all uh, seven of them. And um, the top five, uh, I know, actually, uh, came from uh, the, the Miles, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miles. You can see there, the, uh, two of them were actually actually marked as Mrs. Miles, and all of those were collected on the same day, the 15th of January in 1927. And you can see by the reference numbers there, they were all collected at the same time, and all the manuscripts are together uh, and numbered together as there. So unless there, there was a third person in there somewhere, um, that I know for a fact that uh, the Miles family sang My Boy Billy, Dark Eyed Sailor, the first five in other words, and the Banks of Sweet Dundee and John Barleycorn, uh, we'll assume that uh, they, they were also from the Miles, although as I say, it is possible that there was another person there, but we, we can't know that, and uh, we can prop looking at the numbering there, you've got 10 or 2 on the Banks of Sweet Dundee, and then uh, the last one, John Barleycorn, uh, pre you presu one presumes they all came from the same people with Mr and Mrs Miles, Willie and Jane Miles. Uh, the last four songs, we can only conjecture why the text of these four songs were not taken down or did not survive. Versions of the wedding song had already been collected in Hampshire, Devon and Somerset. Uh, the piece is a simple dialogue performed on stage in costume at country gatherings as is Shepherd Come Home. Uh, that's uh, number four, number five there. Um, of which Hammond had already several versions in Dorset for the Shepherd Come Home. Banks of Sweet Dundee, although not previously found in Dorset, multiple versions had been recorded from neighboring counties and it was widely printed on broadsides. Likewise, John Barleycorn had already been recorded in several versions by Hammond in Dorset. So Vaughan Williams perhaps felt that, you know, they did have got plenty of versions of all those songs. Uh, so there was no need to note down the words of further versions. So as far as folk song research goes nowadays, it would appear that the text of these four versions were denied to us almost a century later. Not quite. <laughs> that same vicar of Woodlands mentioned earlier, Charles Knapp, had a daughter, Dorothy, born in 1902, who became very attached to the old couple, Willie Miles and his wife. And as a little girl in the years before World War I, uh, can we show the picture? There we have, there we have Dorothy Knapp, as she would be, she'd be about six or seven there, perhaps. Uh, a little girl before World War I had eagerly picked up some of their songs and could remember them in full later in life. By the time Vaughan Williams came to Woodlands on the 15th of January 1927, she had left home to train as a teacher, but was made aware of Vaughan Williams' visit by her family. Not only did she become a teacher and move around the country with her husband, Percy Bavy, she also became an active member of the EFDSS, and increased her repertoire from the published works of Sharp and others. That's Dorothy, obviously, in later life. She was in her thirties there. Eventually, she ended up in Hull, which is where I met her in October 1969 as a friend of a friend. Also a source singer, whose repair garage I lived above at the time. This was just a matter of a few hundred yards from where Dorothy lived. Over the period of about seven months, I recorded some 38 songs, mostly, it must be said, which I later identified as coming from various published EFDSS works. It is perhaps significant that seven of the first eight songs I recorded were from the Miles family singing. Recordings of all 38 of these songs are available on, available on the British Library Sound Archive and can be found by using the name Bavy or my own name and then go through my, my collection and then go to Baby. 
Unfortunately, as I made mention in earlier talks, the recording equipment I had access to was pretty basic, and therefore the quality of recording is nowhere near presentation standard. So if you will excuse my attempt at a Dorset accent, <laughs> I'll attempt to sing a little some of the songs to give you a flavour of each. The Dorset wedding song. When shall us get married, love? When shall us get married, love? When shall us get married, Johnny, me own true love? Oh, tomorrow morning, for sure, if they thinks to be good. <laughs> Couldn't us get married sooner, love? Couldn't us get married sooner, love? Couldn't us get married sooner, Johnny, me own true love? What won't get married by moonlight for? Surely the wench is mad. <laughs> and that's got the, that carries on in the same dialogue way uh, for 15 verses. Uh, the shepherd and his wife uh, goes to a variant of the um, Nancy Dawson tune, the ubiquitous tune that she was, here we go around the mulberry bush, uh, Christmas day in the morning, for all sorts of songs. Oh shepherd, oh shepherd, will you come home? Will you come home? Will you come home? Oh shepherd, oh shepherd, will you come home to your breakfast today? Oh, what's thee got for my breakfast, for my breakfast, for my breakfast? What's thee got for my breakfast if I'd have come home today? And that's got 12 verses and it ends with her asking him to come home at night. And he asks, what have you got? And she replies, pair of clean sheets and a nice warm bed, pair of clean sheets and a nice warm bed, pair of clean sheets and a nice warm bed. And then he sings, I leave my sheep in the wilderness, the wilderness, the wilderness. I leave my sheep in the wilderness and I'll come home tonight. And then the long grey beard, which uh, I think perhaps folk will be a bit more uh, familiar with. That last one's found in Herd's manuscripts from 1760s. And this one is also in Herd's manuscripts as well from the 1760s. Uh, now let's see if we can get the tune right for this one. There was an old man come a courting of me. Ha ha ha, and I won't have him. He came courting of me with a patch on his knee and his long grey beard that did want to be shaven. My mother, me, she told me to give him some tea, etc. And then the last verse is, uh, my mother, she told me to take him to church. I took him to church and left him in a lurch. And that's got five verses, that one. And then my boy, Billy, um, again, it's a pretty standard, my boy, Billy, except for the fifth verse, which I'll, I'll go into a bit later. Where have you been all the day, my boy, Billy? Where have you been all the day? Pretty Billy, tell me. I have been all the day courting with the lady gay. But she is too young to be taken from her mammy. But she is too young to be taken from her mammy. And the fifth verse, which is different to normal versions, can she wash a crinoline, my boy Billy? Can she wash a crinoline, pretty Billy, tell me? She can wash a crinoline, hanging out and taking in. But she is too young to be taken from her mummy. But she is too young to be taken from her mummy. So, back to the others. Of the 38 songs, 12 of them I've so far identified as having been learnt from tradition in Dorset. Also from the Miles family, she learnt Nelly Ray, Down Where the Water Lilies Grow, Drink Puppy Drink and The Carter. Two others learnt generally in Dorset were The Carrion Crow and The Seven Joys of Mary. And then only a couple of weeks ago, thanks to Ben Schwartz's interest, we spotted another. Dorothy sang a fragment of Rosebud in June, which I had assumed she'd learnt from a published book. But in the short garbled version she remembered is a line found only in one other version, and that is in an older version from Dorset. The line, they'd make a fine show. So thanks to Ben for making me aware of that. And uh, I'm well in time, so I'm just gonna give a, a little conclusion here and then we can have a few questions. 
as Nick Dow uh, in, in the last lot of talks and others have demonstrated, there is even now still material out there to be collected. Northern England hunting songs are still, still being written and performed, as Sue is well aware. People have old recordings and manuscripts hoarded away in their lofts. Mudcat Forum has a wealth of material being added almost on a daily basis from tradition that is remembered or still alive. Nick can still sing along with his gypsy friends. It's still out there, some of it under our very noses. And I've got five minutes left. So you can have five minutes extra, somebody. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Great start to the day. I think you should audition for a job on the archers, actually, with your uh, <laughs> with your country folk accent. Uh, very good. Um, well, if anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. As always, you know how to do it down at Reactions. Steve. Is there any chance that Maud Carpillis was with Rafe on the day? I, th I think if, um, I, I don't think so, because I think if uh, if the, my correspondent, if Dorothy, Dorothy Bavy had, uh, had known about that, she would, have, she would have said something about Maud Carpillis being there as well. I think she would have said about it, yeah. It's possible. There is a possibility, but uh, I can't think why Maud Carpillis would go on a single journey like that uh, all the way to Dorset. I, in fact, I can't even think why Vaughan Williams would, never mind uh, Maud Carpillis. In, um, you know, in the middle of winter in, in 1927, uh, he'd been in Dorset the year before, in summer, in the middle of summer, but uh, I, I, just, I just don't know, you know, why, why he was there. Perhaps he was visiting someone, perhaps he knew someone, or perhaps someone had written to him, as I say, and said that uh, the, the, the lady who he went to in uh, 1926 knew some quite a lot of child ballads. Now, that would have been a big draw there for him to go and actually note them down. But uh, the, these sort of seven songs are hardly sort of child ballads. No, no they're not rare songs, are they? Um, no, Derek's they're not. got his hand up. Derek? Uh, yes, th thanks very much, Steve. I was um, uh, while you were talk well while you were singing, I could wander into the other room and get the books and have a look and still hear you. Um, and of course, I, I mentioned the Miles uh, couple in the uh, paper I did about Maud Carpley's song collecting at the um, whichever year it was, 2013 song conference. And I'd assumed then that she had been the collector and been. Uh, to Dorset and collected the songs because they were in her manuscripts. And at that time, according to what I wrote, said and, and then wrote in the conference papers, um, the songs hadn't been located in Vaughan Williams's collection, but obviously um, that's now been remedied. Yeah. Full English and, and, and so on, and they've been found. Um, just on the Dorset thing, I, um, uh, I, I was also just looking at Vaughan Williams's um, biography by Ursula. Um, in which she uh, did, unhelpfully doesn't give <laughs> where he was in January 1927. Oh, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, uh, but by coincidence, just at that point from the 20, 1926 to 27 uh, change uh, in, in the book, uh, she starts talking about him going on walking tours and he liked going to Dorset. On ah, right. Tours. That, that figures. The people he... Uh, because in earlier years, before the First World War, he used to do this with Gustav Holst. Um, but uh, by 1927, he was doing it with other friends. It's, it's in uh, Ursula's biography. Um, so that might be why, why he was there and then just suddenly came across these people. I don't know how that would happen. Um, but anyway, that's one possibility that he was there for a walk. Yeah, one thing we could both try is uh, check the handwriting on the manuscripts of the the uh, three songs that were in Maud Carpillis and see, yeah. see whose handwriting it's in. It, yeah. it won't be conclusive, but it might it might help. Because, mm. of course, when he, in, it, with the Ella Leather collection, um, sometimes she was making phonograph recordings, sending them to Vaughan Williams. I think this happened elsewhere as well. And then he would transcribe it from the phonograph and then it get it gets confusing about whether this is something that Vaughan Williams collected or um, 
or L11. Uh, I think that's happened down in Dorset, Hampshire as well, didn't it? Yes, it happened with, with Gar George Gardner. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, I've got no more hands up. <clears throat> um, so we can, we can, we're early. Good Lord. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we can <laughs> move on. And we're going on to Elaine now. Elaine joining us from Seattle, which is um, somewhere foreign, I think. Uh, uh, and Elaine, fellow, fellow librarian, works hard for the Vaughan Williams Library, wrangling data, as she calls it. Um, also used to work for Library of Congress, I believe. And an expert on the tunes, especially, collected by uh, Carpenter in Britain in between the wars. So uh, that's what Elaine's going to be talking about. James Madison Carpenter and his recordings from the folk plays. And if you're interested in Mama's plays, there's a hell of a lot of stuff in Carpenter, more than anyone else, in fact, from that time. So uh, uh, you should have a look at Carpenter's manuscripts, which are all up on the Vaughan Williams site, of course. So over to Elaine. Okay, uh, Martin, I need to share my screen. Okay, now we're working. All right. Step two. Share yeah. Get there. Yep, we got that. Right. Now, oh. the chat's in the way. <laughs> Should come up. All right, is it working? Yes, we have that. Okay. Now for the music and now for the fun. Carpenter's recordings of songs from folk plays. This is a photo of Eddie Cass uh, <clears throat> sitting in a pub garden. I would like to state that most of what I know about traditional drama, I learned from the late Dr. Eddie Cass while we worked together on the Carpenter Collection. It was a great honor and pleasure to work with him and he is sorely missed. Now we've got James Madison Carpenter. Uh, Carpenter was a Mississippi born, Harvard trained collector who between 1928 and 1936 amassed a vast horde of British songs, stories, tunes, customs, and folk plays. Although he began his fieldwork with sea shanties, when he returned to Britain for a second, longer collecting trip, he cast his net wider. In a lecture leaflet, Carpenter claimed that he had traveled 40,000 miles through Britain, assembling approximately 14,500 pages of notes 179 dictaphone cylinders, 560 photographic images, and 40 drawings. It is unlikely, <clears throat> excuse me, it is unlikely that Carpenter knew of the existence of traditional drama before he encountered it in Oxfordshire in 1933, but he soon made up for lost time. Carpenter estimated that he had collected over 300 folk plays, including approximately 36 recordings of songs associated with the plays. He had planned to write a book on the subject and it commi mm, commissioned George Baker to provide illustrations. Here's an example of one of Baker's drawings featuring a family watching the mummers and you can recognize some of the characters there. Aside from E.C. Cott's investigation of the Calling On song and Ian Russell's work on the Tuck plays, the music for the songs associated with folk plays has largely been ignored. Many of the collected songs lack a tune, and most early folk play collectors were primarily interested in the literary aspects of the plays rather than the music. Some early folk song collectors, such as, such as Cecil Sharp, Lucy Broadwood, and Henry Hanmont, collected songs associated with folk plays but not the play texts. It was only in the latter part of the 20th century that portable equipment capable of recording multiple voices for durations of longer than a few minutes allowed collectors such as Ian Russell to record songs within the context of the plays. 
<clears throat> this is an Edifone cylinder machine, and it's uh, similar to what Carpenter used. Carpenter embraced the technology of his day, using a cylinder recorder and a typewriter in the field. Due to the design of the cylinder recorder, which used a speaking tube to capture the sound, he could not record the performances of the plays. Instead, an individual dictated the text while he typed it up. He recorded the songs with the machine, but also typed the song text at the point of the play in which it occurred. There are several types of tunes. <clears throat> the songs associated with Mummer's plays often had well-known tunes fitted with words appropriate to the occasion. Two of the most popular tunes found in the folk plays are Greensleeves and God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Tunes associated with wassail songs were also common. Some songs appear to have been based on other popular songs or dance tunes, though they're difficult to trace. It made sense from the player's standpoint to use a tune everyone already knew, as it was easier for them to remember and familiar to their audiences. There are different types of songs within the place. Uh, within the Carpenter collection, the songs associated with folk plays comprise four main types opening songs, calling on songs, dialogue songs, and closing songs. Opening songs were used to announce the arrival of the group, declare their intentions, and warm up the audience. Sometimes the opening song is preceded by requests for room for the actors. At other times, this request is incorporated into the song itself. The text of the Chattelworth Berkshire Mummer song shows many of the characteristics of house visiting customs. It follows the usual form, giving blessings to the master of the house, mentioning the difficulties of travel, the fact that they only visit once a year, and so on. There's no luck about the house. Well known as the song in the late 18th century Scotland and a dance tune in the 19th. The tune appears in Bride's favorite collection of 200 select country dances circa 1775, the Scots Musical Museum in 1787, and Wilson's A Companion to the Ballroom in 1816, among other places. A common feature of this type of song is the use of repetitive non-lexical phrases, followed by something like, while we are come this Christmas time, a purpose to be merry. Songs with similar lines were collected from other mummers in Berkshire, and within the Carpenter collection, this refrain also appears in the Sherburne Gloucestershire play and was collected from an unnamed informant near Bampton, Oxfordshire. But these renditions were sung to different tunes. The song recorded from the Mummers south of Bampton employs the tune of There's Nay Luck About the House, but the words are unintelligible in places. This is a Baker drawing of a clown. In other plays, such as the sword dance plays of Greetham and Bellerby, the opening song induce, introduces the clown or fool character as a sort of narrator. It often includes fantastical, nonsensical, or exaggerated statements. In Greetham, the song begins humbly enough, they sent me before to knock at your door to see if you'll let us come in. Oh no, I'm a little I've made a good metal I'm for to tell you a lie. 
technical problem here. It doesn't want to go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. Calling on songs. Calling on songs name the players and describe them, though often this description has nothing to do with the action of the play. These songs may be sung by one or more players or as a sequence of stanzas sung by each actor in turn. This type of song is usually found in the sword dance plays of Northeast England but may also appear in the Northwest regions as part of a hero combat player play or as a standalone song perceiving a sword dance. The calling on song often features formulaic phases, such as the first that I call on. The singer announces each character one at a time and describes each one in a few lines. In the sword dance plays, this may be the first and last anyone hears of these characters, as often the dancers take no part in the action. In some instances, the calling on song is the only dramatic element. This leads us to wonder if there was once a play now lost, or if they borrowed the song from the plays as a way to get the audience's attention. This is a photo of Ampleforth, the uh, sword dancers. And uh, Carpenter took this photo as far as we can tell. The character in the front and center is the, is the clown or fool, and he is wearing a sword lock around his neck. And this often um, is a ritualized execution. They uh, kill off the clown with swords. <laughs> there are several sword dance calling on songs in Carpenter collection. One from Erston, Northumberland, a rapper dance without a play. And two from long sword dances with plays from Breatham in Durham and Hunton in the North Riding of Yorkshire. Although he collected plays from Ampleforth, he did not record the songs. The Greetham text in the following recording is very similar to the song Carpenter collected from Hunton. The clown introduces the king, who then calls in the other dancers. All the He'll call his young men in by one by two by two. All the time he's missing his man. He's missing his come from France. He's the first man in our league and the second in our town. The next category is dialogue songs, sometimes also referred to as wooing songs. These songs directly relate to the plot or comment on the action. Songs of this type are found in the plow plays, where the plot moves forward via songs, or sung dialogue in the form of alternating stanzas, performed by individual characters such as duets, or by the whole company. Baker drawing of the recruiting sergeant here is a bit fanciful, um, but there you go. <laughs> in the market racing play, <clears throat> Excuse me. The interaction between the recruiting sergeant and the fool is performed by the two characters singing their lines to the same tune. The sergeant entices a prospective recruit with promises of money, liquor, women, and a smart uniform. The fool agrees to join up as a distraction from his broken heart. Carpenter recorded Thomas Sellers singing both parts, so the effect of this interaction is lost. First, we'll hear the enlisted sergeant. And then the fool replies. The tune for the Fool and the Enlisting Sergeant's dialogue songs also appears in the Claypole play, collected by Spratley, and was collected by H. H. Albino in Busby, Lincolnshire. 
The fact that this tune was connected with multiple plow plays may point to a common but as yet unidentified source. And if you happen to know the tune, let me know. <laughs> Closing songs. These songs are sung while collecting donations from the audience. They may have little to do with the action of the play and are meant to elicit generosity from the spectators and signal the end of the performance. The Bellerby and Hunton plays used a song to bid farewell and to hint one of their number could use a new coat as a sly way of requesting contributions. The final song in the Greetham play states as a prelude to the collection, we will have a dance and the doctor will seek his pay. In the Hunton play, it is the fiddler seeking his pay. At a Robin Hood play from Bampton, Oxfordshire, collected from E. Tanner, gives us an example of one of these songs. The text invokes the Christmas season as a reason for generosity. Now for the music, and now for the bond, our street is already in Christmas time, so welcome in there, get in good cheer. We're all by the Christmas songs from the New Year, green, green, and yellow, so we love our boys and work with their faith, the crowd is in a good place. All he wants is money. My heart will be killed, I'm very bad off. Let me just plainly see. My mother's three days and left with her blood is to make the soul that is greeting. May God bless all friends and all that are here. Merry, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. There is an affinity between these songs and songs used in other alms-seeking house-visiting customs. Whether the group provides a song, dance, or play, or perhaps all three, makes little difference to the fact that they have done so in hopes of receiving something in return from their audience. Next up we have a Baker drawing of Galoshans battling Beelzebub. The Scottish folk play is one of the unusual items in the Carpenter collection. Andrew Roberts gave Carpenter the Galoshans play from Lauderdale, Scotland, that he had learned in his youth in the last third of the 19th century. In this rare version of the play, all the parts are sung. Here's a brief excerpt where you will hear elements similar to opening songs and calling on songs. You can uh, hear that he was having a little trouble remembering, um, and then I believe Carpenter actually picked up the needle and then put it down again for that last verse. And it goes on a bit longer, and he does seem to remember things better after that. <laughs> okay. Um, the tune Robert sang was apparently in common use. Emily Lyle published the only other known music for the song, sung form of the play, from Andrew Rennie of Kippen, active between 1899 and 1903. Rennie's music bears close resemblance to that which was sung by Roberts. It seems to have begun life as the first strain of Bonnie Jean of Aberdeen, a Scottish reel and song tune. The earliest example in print shown here is in Orpheus Caledonius, 1725, with words by Alan Ramsey. The tune endured in popularity, and in the mid-19th century, a completely different set of words from James Ballantyne became associated with it under the title Castles in the Air. In this incarnation, the song was published intermittently well into the 20th century. The song's popularity in the late 19th century led to several parodies, including the infamous body song known as The Ball of Kiran Muir. 
There we have a group of young children in costumes, two of them crossing wooden swords. The play from Andrew Roberts' era in the late 19th century was generally performed by children. And from the photos like this in Emily Lyle's book, at least one generation, at least in later generations, they were rather young children. It must have been an interesting incongruity to hear a group of youngsters singing about the brave Galatians to the tune of what the adults knew as a body song. Finally, we come to the subject dear to my mentor's heart, the Pace Egg play. This hero combat play is defined by the fact that it takes place at Easter rather than the more usual Christmas performances and geographically seems to be confined to the northwest of England. Carpenter collected only one version of the Pace Egg play from Midgley. In this photo, the players are again children with quite fanciful headgear. As described to Carpenter, they wore, quote, hats made of cardboard, flat rim, flat top, arch made of wooden rims, decorated with colored tissue paper, a bell suspended in the center. The earliest text from Midland was written down by William Henry Hardwood at the request of Frank H. Marsden around 1930. Carpenter recorded Wallace Patrick singing the comic character Tosspot song. This song features self-deprecation, especially concerning his dress and mental agility, leaving a touch of swagger. Carpenter recorded Wallace Patrick reading the play from the Hardwood text, but we do not know if the music was sung from Hardwood's notation. The melody itself on the cylinders is nearly identical to the notation that Hardwood gave. What can we learn from the Mummer songs in the Carpenter collection? The performance style seems to be relaxed, matter of fact, not overly dramatized, and often with rhythmic emphasis as opposed to a sort of flowing ballad style. Um, looking at the typescripts in the cases where he took down the same play from multiple people, there is some level of individual variation. This is a part of the disc index listing the contents of disc 68 and part of 69. As shown here, Carpenter's index of the recordings can be vague, often saying nothing more than a mummer's song perhaps a hint at the location. Eddie Cass and I worked out the attribution of the recorded songs to particular singers by matching the audio to the typescript. This was possible because of the subtle differences between texts. The Carpenter Collection is up on the VWML archive site, and this presentation has only just scratched the surface. I encourage anyone interested in the songs associated with folk plays to take a look at the Carpenter Collection. And thank you. That was excellent. Okay. We've still got the flowers on the screen, but uh, I saw people are uh, yeah. applauding. I'm still working on how to get out. <laughs> That's right, yeah, right. Yes, there they are. There's the people all applauding. Excellent. Thank you, Elaine. As an old mama's researcher, I was very pleased to hear and see all of that. Um, I must admit, I find the George Baker pictures so fanciful that I doubt if he ever saw a, a real play. Um, they're all very weird. I don't know whether you agree with me, Elaine, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't like people to think that's what mamas look like. No, no, and and yeah, like the Galatians, I mean, it's so different from the reality of children. You know, he's got this big burly guy in a kilt. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, 
uh, the, the the first one I showed was does look kind of like a you know there's a family sitting around and the, the players are waiting to come in off off through the doorway but uh, yeah in general I think uh, he he hadn't had that much experience seeing them and I think either Carpenter um, described them to him or gave him copies of the the play text I'm not sure how he heard about them but he kind of seemed to understand some of the back the story but the the pictures themselves were very very much not like the play <laughs> yeah exactly yeah now we I don't have any questions or comments from anybody uh, how many how many actual recordings I know he collected 300 plays he um, do we know how many he actually recorded the, the songs to, rather than just wrote down the words? Yeah, um, I think I wrote got, it down in here somewhere. <laughs> we've got people queuing up now, so. Yeah, there's about 36 recordings of songs associated with the plays. Um, as far as we can tell, it's kind of, you know, anything with Carpenter, it's really hard to, <laughs> to yeah. know exact numbers. Um, and occasionally it's like we, we piece together things that were in, you know, recorded in different places that were all connected to the same play. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Ian, you've got your hand up. Try and keep it snappy if you can, Ian. Thank you, Steve. Um, Elaine, I have to look at Papa Storr's calling on song because, um, like Ampleforth, that is quite extraordinary and uh, maybe gives a key to one or two more things that um, tell us about another aspect of the sword dance and of the mumming play, Nexus. Yes, I have been uh, lucky enough to actually see the Papa Store sword dance, uh, thanks to uh, NAFCO when you invited them down from Shetland. <laughs> um, it was... Um, it was very interesting because they don't actually sing it. Uh, they do, they have a calling on, but it's spoken. And um, there, I, I did look further into that and uh, the Elizabethan era, I believe there were, there were some things in um, dramas that had similar patterns where they would call in the players one by one. So, um, there's historical precedent how much of it actually oozed into the the tradition i don't know but i you know much like the morris dances that copied the choreography um of the social dances you wonder how much they were copying some of the some of the plays that were done so it's it's uh, it's something that needs more looking into uh, we, we've got lots of hands up now, so moving on to Margaret, keep it swift if you can, please. Yes, um, thank you. I found that very interesting. I must admit that when I heard Andrew Rennie singing that song, the recording of it, it didn't remind me of the Bollockery Muir. It was enough different that I didn't even associate it. And, and it's not identical either to the earlier, the, to the Carpenter recording. It's more... The whole thing is sung. And he suggested that the boys came in at the age of six or seven and they learned the last part, which is in Kamai, we keep on funny. And by the time they had learned that, the next year they got promoted to something a little more, with a little more text. So the range of the age for them was about seven to, to 15, he thought. Or, or the, but there's, there are a lot of verses, right up to Stirlingshire, Perthshire as well, of the Galoshans plays. I don't know if they were all sung. Anyhow, very interesting. Thank you very much for that wide sweep. Thank you. Can we move straight on to John? John back. Yeah, I've just about the age of the songs. One of them had the, it went past too quickly for me, had the phrase dash my wig in it. Mm -hmm. And dash my wig or dash my vig was a, 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 a bit of a craze around about 1800, 1820. And there was a song called that by Tom uh, Thomas Hudson. 
but according to a theatre historian, it was just one of, became an irritating catchphrase that everybody used and you couldn't escape from. So um, it does date that song at around between 1800 and 1820, I think. Oh, that's and, very useful. Yeah, it's kind of an odd phrase. It, it sticks out a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's quite possible that somebody was using it to be deliberately antique, as it were. Mm. Um, so it could be afterwards. But Steve's got his hand up. Steve will be the last question for Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Yeah, um, the tune that you were asking about, that uh, one of the calling on songs, uh, the nearest I could get to that was uh, uh, the body song, Caviar Comes from the Virgin Sturgeon, the Virgin Sturgeon's a very fine fish, the Virgin Sturgeon needs no urgent, etc., which is also related to Bobby Shafto. So it might be worth mm -hmm. checking out those two tunes. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Elaine, for that. That was different and uh, re really nice. Re well done. Lovely. Uh, we're going to move on to Brian, Brian Peters. Uh, I know it's best. There he is. You all know Brian. He's given us several talks already to TSF on uh, mostly on A.L. Lloyd's tinkering with, uh, with the songs that he sang. And he's talking about a similar sort of time, the early revival and... Uh, and the folk voice at, in that period. So, Brian, are you ready? Yes, indeed. That's it, we have that. Good, okay, ready to rock. When the Ballads and Blues Club, run in London by Ewan McColl and Peggy Seeger, introduced around 1960 the famous policy that performers restrict themselves to songs in their own language and from their own culture, it forced a move away from American-derived material towards the English folk song tradition. With other folk clubs following suit, a cohort of young, educated and mostly urban or suburban singers suddenly found that they needed to develop a style in which to perform material collected mostly from the rural working class. Their quest from an, for an authentic English folk voice lasted for many years. Revival pioneers McCall and A.L. Lloyd rejected the drawing room arrangements of Cecil Sharp and the art music style of Peter Pears and sought an approach more representative of the music sources. In an article titled The English Folk Voice, Simon Featherstone has claimed that this produced a wholly synthetic style ex exemplified by Kenneth Williams' comic creation, Rambling Sid Rumpo, who allegedly parodied accurately the, I quote, nasal tone, elongated vowels and exaggerated tremolo characteristic of revival singers. Oh, once I took my moolies and set them in a snare. Twas then I spied a scropers man, a wordle in a hair. But I was not afeard, my boys, of that there is no doubt. Oh, it is my delight on a shiny night when the coppers aren't about. <laughs> In defence of my fellow performers, I suggest that even the most eccentric has sounded nothing like Rambling Sid, who is simply Williams at his most arch, intoning suggestive lyrics in a yokel accent that owed its style to cod rustic 78 RPM recordings of songs like Widdicombe Fair. Ewan McCall had a head start in the business of singing style, since his mother and father were Scottish traditional singers. Born James Miller in Salford, it may have been McCall's exile status, or perhaps just a desire for drama, that led him to adopt a highly exaggerated accent, the appropriateness of which is fiercely debated in Scottish folk song circles to this day. We can hear the elements he chose to emphasise in these two recordings of Lord Randall, the first a duet with his source, his own mother, Betsy Miller. I fear ye have been poisoned, Lord Rondo, my son. I fear ye have been poisoned, my bonny young man. Oh, I have been poisoned, mother, mark my bed soon. For I'm sick at the hair, and a fin will I do. And here is McCall performing the same verse solo. Oh, I fear that ye are 
Paisen glor dorandel my son. I fear that ye are paisen my bonny young man. Oh, I, I am paisen me dar mak my bed soon. For I'm sick at the hair, and I fain what will I do? McCall hypes up the Scots accent, rolls his R's and practically spits out the word Paisen, also incorporating a kind of a yelp and a fallen pitch at the end of one line that are presumably his own inventions. His approach to the Scottish ballads in which he specialised was generally similar, declamatory and theatrical, although he was capable of using a more whimsical tone for comic or erotic material, and in later years he softened his attacking edge. Here he is in 1986. When I was a bachelor, airy and young, I followed the roving trade. And the only thing that I'd done that was wrong was to court a servant maid. I courted her all the summer time and part of the winter too. And many's the time she rolled in me arms For fear of the foggy dew, dew, dew For fear of the foggy dew As a trained actor, McCall was prepared to experiment at times with different accents he deemed appropriate to the material. Fare you well, the princess, land in stage, rave a fare you well. I'm off to California, a place I know right well. McCall was technically a very gifted singer, extremely accurate in pitch and diction, fully in control of ornament and vibrato, and undeniably thrilling at his best. Accuracy was not one of Bert Lloyd's attributes. Peggy Seeger describes a lovely voice that could barely hold on to a pitch, but he too could thrill with his bracing high notes, preferring generally to use the upper end of his range. Uh... me was bound apprentice because his parents they were poor so I took him from St. James's workhouse all for to sail on the Greenland shore it's important to remember that when Lloyd and McCall were developing their styles, there were few recordings of traditional singing readily available, and Lloyd seems to have based his approach largely on Harry Cox, Phil Tanner, and possibly Joseph Taylor. In his book, The Singing Englishman, published in 1945, Tanner, the magnificent singer from the Gower, is the only traditional singer referenced. Lloyd was clearly influenced by Tanner's style, as we can hear in these recordings of Henry Martin. Hello, hello, cried bold Henry Martin. How dare you come sailing so night? We're a rich merchant ship bound for old England, England, England. Will you please for to let us pass by? Even though Lloyd selected a different variant of the same ballad, you can hear Tanner's influence. Listen to the decoration on the word, hello. Hello, hello, cried Henry Martin. How far are you going, says he? I'm a rich merchant ship for old England. I am bound, I'm bound, I'm bound. Will you please for to let me pass free? 
Like McCall, Lloyd refined his style over the years, from a stentorian and straightforward approach on his 1950s recordings of child ballads to a much more conversational later style that took advantage of the vocal waywardness described, again by Peggy Seeger, as like listening to a breeze sing. Oh, hold your tongue, dear captain. You know such talks in vain. And if our shipmates come to know, they would make sport and game. But when that we to get ashore, some pretty girls we'll find for to ramble along with us, bold lads, seeing you're that way inclined. It's about a few days after we reach the London shore, and this gal put on her petticoats, which made the captain roar. Oh, a sailor I have been on board, but a maid I am going ashore. And you've missed your chance, dear captain, so farewell forevermore. <laughs> McCall believed firmly in a studied approach to singing folk songs and explained in his autobiography his approach to the ballad Lampkin, which involved a startling degree of micromanagement. The placement of the tiniest pauses or a slightly increased pressure on the plosive consonant P at key moments in the narrative. To impart some of these ideas to the younger generation of singers, McCall and Seeger set up the Critics Group, a discussion forum occasionally airing on the side of didacticism in which the styles of traditional singers were examined and imitated, ballad characters analysed according to the theatrical theories of Stanislavski, techniques like decoration and phrasing taught, and instrumental accompaniments evaluated. Lloyd refused from the start to be involved, and while some singers found the sessions extremely rewarding, others disdained the self-consciousness of the approach, insisting that authentic traditional singers simply got on with it. McCall and Seeger arranged for accomplished Irish singers like Paddy Tunney and Joe Heaney to visit London and held them up as role models in the manner of vocal decoration, although the realisation soon took hold that the traditional style in England was actually much less ornamented, although that's not to deny the existence of decoration among English singers, from Joseph Taylor to Bob Copper. And here's Harry Cox singing Betsy the Serving Maid. Let's go ahead, one only son, and Betsy said so soon he won. And Betsy being so blithe and fair, soon drew his poor heart into a snare. Harry Cox was often cited as an influence by Peter Bellamy, one of the revival's most outspoken advocates of the value of source recordings in the development of a personal style. However, as Bellamy explained in an interview, I was aware that even if one could do a really good job of trying to sound like Harry Cox, that one was going to get nowhere in terms of communicating with the majority of the people out here now. There has got to be a line which you can walk that embodies the traditional elements, but that is still relevant to today. It's no good trying to be an imitator of a style which is archaic. So let's hear Peter Bellamy performing the same song, which he learned from Cox's recording. Now the squire had one on a sudden, and very soon Betsy thirty one. And Betsy being so blithe and fair, this poor boy's heart she did in snap. Apart from recasting Cox's major tune in the Aeolian mode, Bellamy has raised the pitch, increased the speed by 50%, and replaced Cox's ornaments with his own characteristic bleat, making the performance much edgier. A hard, often nasal tone, and a preference for pitching towards the upper end of the vocal register became the norm for many of the singers who followed in Lloyd's footsteps, like Bellamy, Lou Killen and Nick Jones. In the field of decoration, no singer could match Anne Briggs, who, like many of the revival's young guns, was closely associated with Lloyd. Although never a critics group member, Briggs developed a distinctive skill initially by emulating Isla Cameron, an accomplished singer from McCall's circle. In an interview, she admitted, I really went a bit wild on the decoration because that was what I enjoyed doing. It wasn't decoration to me. It was part of the way to sing the song. It could convey so much more in terms of emotive feeling and atmosphere. It was an instinctive feeling associated with those old traditional songs. The cook is a pretty bird. She sings as she flies. 
She brings us good tidings, tells us no lies. She sucks the little bird's eggs to keep her voice clear. And when she sings cuckoo, the summer draws near. Anne Briggs was a significant influence on the leading female singers who followed, like Maddie Pryor and June Tabor. Tabor confessed to having copied Briggs twiddle for twiddle and credited her as the principal source of her technique. Martin Carthy, probably the most significant male role model amongst the 1960s younger generation, was never a disciple of McCall, although in his early days he was influenced by him, delivering songs deadpan, dutifully learning decoration and performing in a slightly formal style. As the revival swung into the 1970s, however, he, along with many of his peers, began to experiment with vocal devices that were neither taught by the critics group nor obviously derived from traditional singers. The folk music press of the day, notably the prolific and outspoken journalist Carl Dallas, accused Carthy and several of his peers, including Peter Bellamy, June Tabor, Nick Jones, Maddie Pryor and Tony Rose, of the crime of mannerism and began to seek it out with the zeal of a witchfinder general. In a 1972 album review, Dallas attacked Carthy for sterile formalism, a focus on vocal tricks rather than song content and exaggerated portamento slides. We can hear some of that in this recording. Three men came out of the west, their fortune for to try. And these three men made a solemn vow, John Polycorn should die. They plowed and they sowed and they herded him in. He threw clothes on his head. And these three men made a solemn vow, John Polycorn was dead. Carthy now confesses to having become mannered during this period and, I quote, of leaving the spirit of the thing behind. Experiencing an epiphany in the late 1970s, he subjected himself to a rigorous reappraisal. I realised I'd gone up a blind alley and I had to start again as far as my singing was concerned. Compare these two recordings of Cold, Haley, Windy Night, recorded in 1972 and 1984. Me hat, it is frozen to me head and me feet. They are like a lump of that. Me shoes, they are frozen to me feet with the stand digging at your window. Let me in. The soldier cried, Call daily windy night. Oh, let me in. The soldier cried, For I'll not go back again. No. And fast forward 12 years. Oh, my hat, it is frozen to my head. My feet, they are like a long lead. Oh, my shoes, they are frozen to my feet. I stand digging at your window. Let me in. The soldier cried, cold, ainly windy night. Oh, let me in. The soldier cried, for I'll not go back again. In the second clip, Carthy has dispensed with the slides, sings in a more open, less nasal fashion, and has banished a particular folk revival mannerism introduced originally by McCall and Lloyd, the pronunciation of the word my as me. My is not always easy to vocalise in a wordy lyric, but revival practice went beyond the obvious substitution of the short ma and gravitated towards the piratical, all for me grog. In the kind of vocal effects Carthy eventually opted to abandon, one can detect the genesis of what became a default style for English male folk club singers in the 1970s and beyond. Nick Jones was another singer who backed away from a folk voice, hard, nasal and elaborately ornamented, in favour of something more natural, before his career was tragically cut short. Lord Paterman was a noble lord, a noble lord of high degree, and he shipped him and settled on board of a sailing ship, some for and lad, and he would go see. 
Nine years later, his vocal is much less decorated and more relaxed, allowing the story to breathe. It's of a fair and handsome girl, and she's all in her tender years. She fell in love with a sailor boy, and it's true that she loved him well. For to go off to sea with him, like she did not know how She longed to see that seaport town Called Kennedy, Iowa. Not every revival singer reinvented their style so self-consciously. Cyril Tawney stuck with a mellow baritone reminiscent of Burl Ives throughout his career. Mike and Norma Waterson immersed themselves in recordings of traditional singers, but resolved to sing in a way that came naturally to them, in their own East Yorkshire accents. Shirley Collins came from a working class Sussex family with its own singing tradition, and rejected altogether the prescriptions of what she called the pompous and pretentious critics group. Drawing inspiration from Harry Cox and the Sussex singer George Maynard, for her the English style was restrained and unadorned, and she avoided all but the most subtle decoration, as here in Brig Fair. It was on the 5th of August, the weather fair and mild, unto Brig Fair I did. For my last recording, I'm going to turn the wheel full circle and play you a clip of our keynote speaker from a fortnight ago, Frankie Armstrong, at the climax of the supernatural shape-shifting ballad Tam Lin, which, like so many revival favourites, owed a lot to Burt Lloyd's editorial skills. Frankie, a former member of the critics group, is an acknowledged expert on vocal technique, but what shines brightest here is the blazing passion for an heroic tale. And the last they have changed him all in her arms was to a naked man. And she's flung her mantle over him, crying, me love, I've won, I've won. Oh, crying, me love, I've won. And out and spoke the queen of elfin land from the bush wherein she stood. I should have tore out your eyes, Tamlin, and put into eyes of wood, of wood, put into eyes of wood. The singers I've put under the microscope today were all pioneers in their field, trying out new approaches and making stylistic changes when they felt it necessary. If they made mistakes, it was in a noble cause, and I will cheerfully admit to being a fan of every one of them. If there's a lesson for singers today to learn from all their efforts, I suggest that it is this. Think hard about the way you sing and the story you're trying to tell. By all means, work on vocal techniques that will make the performance more musically pleasing or narratively engaging but always try to be yourself, because the search for an authentic folk voice can often lead to the exact opposite. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It's always like a walk down memory lane, isn't it, when Brian gives a paper? You think, good God. I'm mired in the past. Yeah, that's right. Aren't we all, though, to be fair? Aren't we all? <laughs> that's what folk is all about. Anyway, do we do have time for questions, because Brian kept to time, as he promised he would. Anybody want to um, raise any points? Mm, you've stunned them all into... Um, 
I'm not offended. <laughs> That's good. Oh, Ian has oh, yeah, a... come. Here comes Ian. Ian first. I can't hear you, Ian. No, I'm here now. Good. Thank you very much indeed. That that was uh, interesting to say the least. It was uh, very revealing. Do we have any recordings of McColl's father? Obviously, we had one of his mother there that you very carefully chose for us. Um, yeah, I'm fascinated by that. And uh, there was several other things. You you talked about. Shirley Collins, her style being less adorned, and Frank is the maybe you included that in the same category. I don't know, but I think if you listen to Shirley's style, it has a a great deal of a, uh, adornment that isn't obvious. It isn't flourishes and careful sort of trills or, or turns or passing notes, but there's an awful lot going on there. It's not just a straightforward rendition of a tune or anything, far from it. Um, I wonder if you'd just like to comment on those two points. Yes, I, I would agree with with that. I mean, the, the word unadorned was actually Shirley's own quote from, a, from an interview about how she saw the English style. I mean, obviously, if you compare Shirley with Anne Briggs, it's a very, very different style, but of course there are there are more ways to to decorate or put expression into the way you sing other than the obvious the turns and the mordants and so on so yeah yes of course i'm not saying that that surely um doesn't do anything i mean that's not when i'm talking about being yourself i'm not saying just try and sing as boringly as possible of course i'm saying that your own personality will uh, and what you've listened to will help to determine what comes out when you sing. I just feel that that Shirley had made a point of saying that she wanted to channel what came naturally to her from her family and some of the old singers, especially from Sussex, rather than go and take lessons from from anybody else in what she should be doing. Um, and as far as uh, Ewan McCall's father is concerned, I'm not aware of any recordings. Those ones with his mother, I think, were actually recorded by Peggy Seeger relatively late on. I think his his father, obviously his mother was still alive when he met Peggy. I think his father was long gone by then, although Ewan does speak in his autobiography about remembering the way his father would sing and uh, the, the incredible artistry his, his father would put into the song. So wh who knows, it's possible that McCall got some of his, his approach from his father too. Can we, can we move on to Derek now? Keep it short, please, Derek. Thank you, uh, uh, Brian. Um, uh, of course, uh, a lot of the, the examples you've given are of the uh, older uh, revival singers who are around in the 50s and, and into the 60s. Um, um, and at, at a time when there were fewer field recordings, although I'm guessing that most of the uh, uh, examples you gave or the, the singers uh, as examples that you gave would have had some access to uh, field recordings, um, the few field recordings that were either commercially available or from uh, Vaughan Williams Library or wherever. Um, and I just wonder now, looking down to more recent generations of uh, singers who are singing traditional songs, although they seem to be sometimes few and far between, I'm afraid, as far as the English scene is concerned, um, in terms of their influences, because very often you'll hear them saying, my influence has been Nick Jones and my influence has been Anne Briggs. Um, any reflections on the younger singers without incriminating yourself too much? <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the, young, the younger singers, uh, mentioning no names anyway, but they um, uh, more than one uh, claims the influence of Peter Bellamy, Bellamy. And you can also hear from some of the material that they choose that a number of them will have got Nick Jones albums in their parents' record collections and quite possibly June Tabor albums as well. I also feel that in the case of, of one or two um, of the younger generation of singers, and by the way, this is not making a value judgment, but there are some sensibility f sensibilities from um, more modern popular music are, are entering the picture as well. And, and you know, and, and why not in, in a way? So I know at least one of the younger generation was criticised roundly for saying he didn't see the point of going back to listening to old source recordings because uh, almost like Peter Bellamy was saying that's not going to mean anything to to his or her listeners today. Um, so no, I don't. I, I don't want to 
pass judgment on any of the younger generation. I think in a way, like the previous generation, that they're all finding their own ways to do it. I think one of the points I was trying to make that there wasn't a folk voice, even though I think most of us will be familiar with that sort of folk club voice that was popular at one time that might have uh, derived from Martin, but people just have different ways, different ways of, of experimenting. I, I hear some singers that I, I like a lot these days and singers that I, I like not so much, but that's just my taste. So we've, got a bit, we've got one more question from Conrad, but let me just quote Mervyn Plunkett, who used to say, revivalists always revive the previous revival. Yes, well, that's interesting. I mean, Mervyn, Mervyn Plunkett wasn't uh, terribly well disposed towards the revival at all, I don't think. No, <laughs> not at all. Uh, Conrad, last question from Conrad. Yes, the uh, presentation has been wonderful. I, I've been working this week with Hastings Shack and the Green, which is a revival. One thing to remember about revivals is, is the last line of the presentation pointed out so well that the revivals you come up with might be worse. And it's more like, in my mind, it's like dial stations on a, on a radio dial. There are many, but you have to know where to find what. And you need to know how its structure is, is unique and you can locate it. Find it in an index or find it in a book. And if it sounds vaguely like it started, I think it's acceptable. But uh, too much attention these days is, is put on, I think. Uh, on the importance of change rather than the importance of basic preservation and uh, reflection. But I think, I think change is okay. I don't, I don't see a problem. Uh, it's always been there and it always will be there, like professional musicians who play a bit too well, too studied. It's a spectrum from studied yeah. professionals to people who do what they do. They're all good because we, we have to rely on all of them. If you sing a song that passes, that people enjoy, it comes out okay, then you have as, as, as good a position as being on any stage as with anyone else. Yeah, that, I, think, right. I think all of us who are involved in actually singing these songs, um, particularly those, those who stand up on the stage to do it, we're, we're always trying to find that balance between um, preserving the essence of the old, but bringing some sense of, of the new or and I don't feel that there's it's obligatory to innovate but I think I think we're just bound to do it we can't we can't help it and it's it's where we where we like to find the balance and different uh, different people will find that balance in a different place As right. I like thank you we're going to move on now Conrad thank you great talk Pete uh, Brian thank you very much indeed round of applause again uh, we're going to move on to our last speaker of the whole conference, and she's on last because she booked in the day that we closed the um, the list, and we got a frantic email saying, oh, "I forgot to do it." So Kara's here; she's going to finish us off. Um, Kara's from uh, originally from Colorado, but at the moment she's at the University of Limerick doing a PhD, uh, and she's going to tell us about the Inishowen Song Project. So you've disappeared from my screen. Where have you gone? My back, my internet connection died bang on time there. So ah, there you are. Right. All right. Okay. Is that up and Visible? Yes, we, well, we have it, but we haven't got the full screen play from start. How about that? Yeah, perfect. And all men forlorn that carelessly wander away from your home. I am off by the moonlight and break on the morning I'll be found in the mountains of dark in his I stray to a place they call sweet clan mammy 
in search of a fair one that I might adore. But a maiden to love me, I couldn't find any. From Mindong Bridge to the Gap of Mamon. The Inishowen Peninsula is the most northerly geographic point on the island of Ireland. A rugged and remote area with a long, colorful history, Inishowen sports a unique singing style and a broad repertoire of English language songs. The landscape of Inishon is one of striking beauty, harsh rocky cliffs, beautiful sandy beaches, dark heather moors, rolling green fields, and the ever-changing hues of the Atlantic all around. The landscape and history of the area have inspired the local singers for generations and given rise to a rich collection of local songs celebrating the places and events of the peninsula. In addition, the area's history of immigration and seasonal work migration have added songs from Scotland, England, North America, and elsewhere to the local repertoire. In 1984, Tom Munnelly came to Inishowen on a song collecting trip for the National Folklore Collection based at the Department of Folklore in the University of College, Dublin. His song guides in the peninsula were Jimmy McBride, originally from Guidor in West Donegal, Derry native Jim McFarland, and local Clonmany man, Colm Toland. All three were singers themselves. They were knowledgeable and passionate about the local singers and songs, and already aware of the need to document the peninsula's very special living tradition of English language singing. Tom's collecting trip lengthened from days to weeks and blossomed into a lifelong personal and professional song relationship with Inishowen, which continued until his death in 2007. The following year, 1985, the first fruits of the Inishowen collection were published by Jimmy McBride and Jim McFarland in a book of local songs called My Parents Reared Me Tenderly. This book contained nearly 70 songs unique to the area, but it hardly scratched the surface of the material available. Jimmy began to record singers in their homes and to organize opportunities for older singers to gather and sing. In 1988, he established the Inishowen Traditional Singers Circle and the first Inishowen International Folk Song and Ballad Seminar was held in Ballylithan in 1990. Both the circle and the festival are still active in working to foster, quote, to foster, encourage, and perpetuate the folk song and ballad tradition of the Inishowen Peninsula." End quote. The festival quickly began to attract attendees amongst both traditional singers and academics. While continuing to focus on the local tradition, it expanded to include not just notable singers like Corny McDade, Dan McGonigal, Maggie McGee, and Dennis McDade, but also many of the great singers from around the British Isles. In 1996, Jimmy McBride began to donate his analog recordings of the singers to the traditional music archive, to the Irish traditional music archive, better known as ITMA. This made the recording as available, but only to those able to visit the Dublin-based archive. In 2006, Inishowen native and traditional singer Grace Toland joined the staff of ITMA while also becoming organizer of the Inishowen Singing Weekend and the Circle. This ushered in a new bond between ITMA and Inishowen. ITMA began field recording at the annual festival in 2007, and in 2012, Inishowen Grace initiated the and managed the first iteration of the Inishowen Song Project. This cutting-edge digital project oversaw the digitization and curation of more than 2,000 items of audio, video, text, and photographs, and made them freely available on ITMA's website. Funded by the Inishon Development Par Partnership, this was the first national multimedia microsite and became a model of digital curation for other organizations and collections. 
As well as the sound and video recordings of over 100 singers, the offerings of the current collection include downloadable copies of many local publications, including The Flower of Danaf Hill and My Parents Reared Me Tenderly, the latter of which was re-released by the Inishowan Traditional Singer Circle in 2019. The recordings and video are formatted to make researching and learning songs from the collection as easy as possible. Each song's lyrics are transcribed and each entry is provided with information detailing the song's title, singer's name, collector's name, the date and place of collection, and of course the all-important route number. A little known feature is that all of the song's lyrics are downloadable as lovely PDF files designed for printing. The collection includes many recordings made at the yearly festival and thus showcases not only the wonderful selection of local tradition, but also many of the great singers from other parts of Ireland as well as Scotland, England, and further abroad. And here's just a little taste of Dennis McDade singing a local version of the Shamrock Shore. From London, Derry. We had sent a sail at the Binham Day, seventh of May. Between nine and ten on the night, some more than nine, we arrived at Mobile Bay. <coughs> Fresh water. We had the twenty tons, our passing jars in the store. Least we might run me short, going to the New York, farther and farther from the Shamrock Shore. Despite the excellence and popularity of the current collection, which accounts for as much as 20% of the current traffic to ITMA's website, change is now on the horizon for the Inisho and Song project. ITMA's IT platform has been updated and the existing microsites have in effect been mothballed, meaning that they can no longer be updated or altered. Rather than being the end of an era, however, Grace Tolan saw this technological challenge as an opportunity for a new approach to work with ITMA on the project content through community archiving. Thus began the project of reimagining and relaunching the Inishowen Song Project. Unlike the first iteration of the Inishowen Song Project, which was largely transcribed and cataloged by ITMA staff, most of the work for this relaunch is being conducted by members of the Inishowen Traditional Singers Circle, a group of long-standing members of the Inishowen community, many of them from Inishowen or surrounding areas, plus a few lucky interlopers like myself. In 2020, a team of 17 volunteers began a complete overhaul of the project's content. The first major task undertaken by the new team was to retranscribe the lyrics of all 606 songs on the current site. Immediately, the benefits of having the expertise of the local and longtime singers became apparent. Tricky words, strong accents, unusual turns of phrase, all became much easier to handle with a group of transcribers familiar with the songs, the singers, and the exact areas from which they came. Songs were swapped amongst transcribers and expertise was sought from people familiar with the singers in question or the particular dialect involved. Even poor quality audio files or the occasional interruption in the recordings was often able to be overcome by singers who knew the exact version of the song in the recording, often having learned it from the same source. In some cases, we could even go back to the original singer or their direct descendants. The project of checking the transcriptions meant that the entire collection was revisited by members of the community. Weekly team meetings were enlivened with shared memories of big nights past, cherished friends who have passed on, and a great deal of jovial ribbing as to which of the current circle should be considered the old ones today. The process of adding more context to the collection is ongoing and will hopefully be continued even after the official relaunch of the project. Throughout every step, however, the team has hugely benefited from the expertise of the local tradition bearers leading the work. For example, the team is currently in the process of checking and locating each of the place named mentioned in the collection's songs, including many local names not found on any ordnance survey maps and sometimes nearly forgotten even in the local areas. 
this information will eventually be fed into an interactive digital map on the project to further enhance searching, discovery, and context. Yet perhaps the place where the impact of the Cir Singer's Circle team will be felt the strongest when the project is relaunched will be in the personal knowledge that the community brings to the people behind the songs. One of the most common laments that we all hear and voice about song collections today is that there is often so little information about the singers from whom the songs were collected. Many of our great song collections were created by people who were, for a variety of reasons, outsiders in the community from which they collected. While this sometimes has its advantages, one look at the list of the singers and the current Inishon song project goes a long way to showcase the challenge of collecting and compiling information on the sources. To any outsider, even one acquainted with many of the current singers in the area, the list of names alone is daunting and the prospect of trying to make sense of the surnames, nicknames, and family connections to, to say nothing of the individual lives and personalities of the singers themselves is surely enough to make even the most well-intentioned collector feel rather weak at the knees. Yet this difficulty is much easier to overcome when the collection is maintained by people to whom the singers represented were and are known and loved. The relaunched project will feature newly written biographies for all of the nearly 100 singers currently represented in the archive, most written by people who knew the person in question and quite a few by the singers themselves. In addition, plans are underway for a series of blog essays by singers in the community, which will add a tremendous level of personal context to the songs and the tradition, and will no doubt prove essential to future singers, scholars, and members of the Inishowen community looking to better understand the people involved. In addition to the work already undertaken by the Inishowen Song Project team in revitalizing and recontextualizing the current archive, the newly relaunched site will feature new songs, videos, and more. A taste of the breadth and quality of the archive's video recordings was also showcased at this year's online Inishowen Singing Weekend and can now be viewed on their YouTube channel. Um, and I'll put links for that in the chat in just a second. The official relaunch of the Inishon Song Project is scheduled for December of 2021, and I highly recommend keeping an eye on the Circle's website and Facebook page for forthcoming information about the event. In the meantime, I encourage you to explore the current international, I'm sorry, the current Inishon Song Project available at ITMA and to keep up with the Inishon Traditional Singer Circle on their website and Facebook page. Links are coming here. The ongoing work of the Inishowan Song Project and the Inishowan Traditional Singer Circle is a powerful example of the potential for community involvement with the collection and preservation of their own traditions. But perhaps even more importantly, it is first and foremost, a brilliant resource for anyone interested in traditional songs and the people who sing them. That work? Yep. Yeah, great. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that for the finish. That was wonderful, Cara. Thank you very much. Very exciting Thanks. project. Really lovely singing too. Uh, do we have, we've got time. We have time for questions or comments from anybody. Why is the North Pole called the North Pole? Ah, there's because a question from Ian. Hello, Ian. Again. Hi, Steve. I think I think your question about the North Pole takes priority. <laughs> <laughs> it is Just keep driving north. And they always say um, they always say that if you want to get to, to the Inishon Singers Circle where they meet, they actually meet in the North Pole Pub, but they often say you just turn left at the North Pole. And I thought that was the I went up there and then there we were. <laughs> <laughs> right, Ian, your question. OK. Um, yep, yeah, very much enjoyed that. Fascinating. And uh, as you're aware, um, I've been a visitor to uh, Inishowen for well over 20 years um, since Jimmy set up the festival there, the seminar. Um, now, I wanted to ask you about, uh, particularly about singing style, especially as our theme is the folk voice. And there we saw Dennis McDade singing and uh, what is very interesting is the way he held his body the way he held his head um, this is a style of singing that i've seen in in a show and 
uh, from several singers and uh, I just wondered if you would like to comment on the singing style of the singers that you've encountered. Well, I'm probably not a an expert on that um, other than just having spent a lot of time up in Inishon and, and, and listening to to the singers from there. Um, but it is certainly very unique. And it's interesting that you picked up on the uh, the body posture, because I do think that that's uh, and maybe it's not unique to Inishon, but it certainly is very unusual. And you certainly see it there a lot. Um, I think the the ornamentation styles from Inishon are really interesting because you don't tend to get quite as many of the sort of trills and so forth that you would say expect in Connemara singing. But you hear a lot more of the sort of drawn out lines and especially um, the playing with the rhythm a lot is a, is a common thing that you'll hear in, in with the Inishon singers. Um, but yeah, it certainly is a very interesting and unique a style that is that is sung up there and and uh, um, I suppose the best way to, to experience it is just just dig in and, and listen to the singers. I did put the links there in the chat so if anybody wants to to visit um, I highly encourage that. Yeah please please keep us uh, informed on our TSF meetings with the progress of the of the project. Oh absolutely it's, we'll do. It's very very interesting. We don't have any other questions. Do anybody else want to um, comment? No, we don't. Well, Sorry. thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for sticking with us for the whole of our conference. We are back uh, in a fortnight's time. We're back on our normal fortnightly Sunday evening schedule. Uh, 16th of May is our next one. And we're taking um, bookings, as it were, for every other Sunday up into July, which is when we'll revisit these sessions and see if we want to carry on or change in Thank any you way. Just waving her hand. Frankie Hold on a second. Waving. We Sorry? Frankie waving her hand for a question. Frankie Armstrong. All oh, right. Frankie, did you want to say something? I can't see you on my screen, so I can't see how you're doing. That's it. Frankie, I've unmuted you now. There you are. Oh, thanks. Yes, that's a, I was told. Sorry, I'm a bit late I'm being picked up on. But there was a description. I, as somebody who, again, is really interested in how people use their bodies and their head, I, 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 it was just talked about, but only if you could see it. So I just wanted to know what was that distinctive in the show in um, body use? Right, oh. Ian or Cara? Um, I could come here, Frankie. Um, it's uh, the fact that eye contact isn't made, the fact that the head is often lowered, the fact that often the head is tilted just a bit to one side the fact that you wouldn't know who was singing in the room unless you really have the opportunity to study and often uh, it's you get to a ver verse four or five before you realize where the singer is and who the singer is especially if the room is crowded um, it is a very much a style in which the singer I won't say it hides their identity, but puts their identity well to the back and puts the identity of the song well to the fore. Is, yeah. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I... But can I also say while I'm uh, able to, because um, Steve has said to presenters, please remember there are some of us I'm not the only one who are visually impaired. And therefore, sometimes it, it is very frustrating to have something that's so dependent on a, a visual ability to see what's happened without any you know, auditory description. So just to remind everybody who's going to present in future that the, there are some of us who can't see the screen. Yeah. I Thank you, Frankie. We all um, we must all remember that. Certainly, before the presentations, we always say to the people who are giving slides, um, verbalize the slides. Um, but we forget to say, do the same in the questions and uh, and the comments. 
Okay, back to um, what I was saying is that I'm taking bookings for our normal three or four paper sessions every other Sunday. And we have some slots available at the end of May and June and July. So don't be shy, ladies and gentlemen. Put yourself forward if you've got something you'd like to um, share with us. Now, Martin wants to say a few words. If I may. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to Frankie for starting this, not just making the keynote, but also the idea for this session came from sitting down with her over lunch a couple of years ago. So uh, I hope that we've met your expectations, Frankie. Um, I did also want to do, in terms of talking about um, meeting expectations, I wanted to ask you to just help with a poll on Zoom. Um, give, what I'm going to do is to put this uh, questionnaire up um, if you could click on the appropriate boxes in the presentation, answering the question, thinking about the whole conference, how much did you enjoy the event? Um, if you could just uh, click on that, that'll help us get some idea of how well we've done with this. How do we do that, Martin? You, go, do. you go to the click again. If you can see the box, you might not be able to see it, Steve, because you Click on poll at the bottom if you can't. Yes, I can see the poll, but I actually, so we click on our screens, do we? Yeah. yeah. So that's got. How many times can I click? <laughs> Just the one. <laughs> <laughs> you click once and it disappears. That's it. Oh, well, I clicked and nothing bloody will happen. But then uh, that's life. It's a technical problem, Steve. You fancy those. OK, polls closed. And uh, oh, the answer is right. more than half of the people enjoyed the event very much. So that's that's great. Um, let's just share those results with you. Um, while that's sharing, I've just got a couple of other quick points. Um, I'll be putting out a newsletter um, next week is the first for some time you've probably forgotten that i need your input to that i haven't had much news from people recently so if you've got any news that you think we ought to be sharing um, and i do hasten to add this is news about traditional song um, do let me know and we'll see whether we can include it in the newsletter and then finally um, we're being very optimistic and thinking about the future um, we're assuming that possibly before the end of this year, we will be able to have a live event. Um, we also realise that many of you couldn't get to a live event, even if we held it in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, so we've got to think about new technologies that will help us to do this in the future. If anybody has experience of ways of recording and transmitting um, live events. Um, I'd be very interested to hear from them about the technologies that you have used. So give us a shout and uh, we'll see what we can do once the world returns to something approaching. Well, it never has been normal, no, but approaching think, normal. I don't think we count ourselves as normal, do we? <laughs> nah. We're not normal. So no. thank you, Steve. That's, uh, that's me. Thank you, Martin and Sean. So thanks everybody for being with us. And thanks again for all our speakers at the conference over the last three weeks. Um, and I think all we can say is see you in a fortnight's time. Everybody, yes, goodbye, fare thee well.